I don't know if they put it back again. Today I decided to do something a little bit different. I decided to do something I've been thinking of doing for a while. And that is to take you kind of in depth into the world of playing cards. <clears throat> so, let's start off by looking at exactly what is a deck of cards. Obviously first you have your tuck case, which will have all sorts of information on the deck itself and company branding and manufacturing information normally. More importantly is the cards. Most playing cards are <clears throat> 54 or 56 playing cards in a deck. USBC is normally 56. Other companies like Expert Playing Cards and Legends are normally 54. Sometimes they have additional cards. <clears throat> Same with a lot of other companies. What you will get is 52 cards, Ace through King, and Aces. Uh, sorry, and two Jokers, which aren't usually too important. Now, within a deck of cards, you'll also find four suits, of course, diamonds, hearts, spades, and clubs. Those are your four main suits. There's other decks that might have different suits or custom suits, but they're not usually as fun. <laughs> and there's a lot of symbolism in a deck as well. For instance, the Ace of Spades is known as a death card because of a gambling incident a long time ago. Um, there is four suits, which represent the four seasons. There is <clears throat> 13 cards in each suit, which represent the 13 lunar cycles and essentially the 13 weeks in each season. 52 cards and 52 weeks in a year, not including the tokers. If you add up the value of every card in a deck, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Zax has 11, Queens has 12, and Kings has 13. It comes out to 364. Add one for the Joker, and you get 365, which is how many days there is in a year. And of course, if you have a leap year, forget the Joker. It's that simple. Um, <clears throat> what else is there? I can tell you. Also, well, like I said, clubs, hearts, spades, diamonds, four seasons. Hearts, hearts and diamonds representing spring and summer. Spades and clubs kind of representing fall and winter. Dark and whatnot, I guess. And um, I, I would say also hearts and diamonds represent day. Spades and clubs represent night more than anything. So all sorts of little things that go into a deck of cards. <clears throat> That's kind of, you know, breaking down a deck of cards right to its core and the symbolism. Now, with playing cards, there's all sorts of things to look for. There's all sorts of sizes. Of course, you got your standard poker size playing cards. You can also get bridge size playing cards which are same lengthwise, but they are about a quarter of an inch narrower. Some people like them a little bit more if you have smaller hands for handling purposes. And I can understand that myself personally. Um, of course, there's other sizes as well. There's this, which is a uh, <clears throat> jumbo size, giant size, which is twice the size of a regular card and it gets even bigger with the jumbo giant size which is approximately four times the size of a card of a regular poker card or maybe four times the size of a bridge size card really but it's pretty massive and you would use something like this made for performing magic or the, the other big one <clears throat> because it allows your audience all over to see more clearly of course if you want to do a little more sleight of hand, you're going to use a poker deck. But there's more. <clears throat> there's also mini decks, which are 
half the size of a regular playing card. And there's also micro decks which are half the size of this, which are practically useless, so I don't really care much for them. I do have one or two, but <clears throat> that's that. On top of the 54 cards I mentioned, you also often get add cards or gaff cards, could be double backers, blank cards, some other kind of gimmick or gaff, or just advertisements or duplicates or all sorts of things. Um, of course, most decks, the most common ones, are paper cardstock, which is made up of three layers of two or three layers of paper glued together and pressed together. Usually, they come in two thinnesses. A <clears throat> embossed air cushion finish, which is this, which you'll see has tiny dimples throughout if you look closely, and that allows them to glide a lot better. And then there's also a smooth finish, which does not have any dimples, which I forgot to pull out, but <clears throat> those are the main finishes. And from USB C, you get that an air cushion finish or a smooth finish, also known as the ivory finish. Air Crescent, also known as Vinoid, Cambric, Magic Finish, Performance Coating, <coughs> excuse me, I apologize, and you know, all of the above. Whenever you see a deck of cards from the USB-C, it tends to have all sorts of different names for finishes, but they're all the same. They only use two types, Smooth and Embossed Air Crescent Finish, also known as Linen Finish. Most companies will use both finishes. And they're, they're both good. I got no problems with either one. Some prefer one or the other. There's not many differences, although I believe smooth finish decks will uh, might be a little bit better for cutting and forcing and stuff like that because the cards will stick together a little bit better. With these ones, they're also good because they glide a lot better. Um, but I haven't seen any smooth finish decks lately. <clears throat> for stocks, when it comes to USB-C, they have two stocks. A bicycle stock, which is a little thinner, more flexible, and a B stock, which is a little bit thicker and stiffer. Some prefer one, some prefer the other. I don't really mind either way. And of course, if you're newer to playing cards, you won't really notice the difference. But if you put two decks side by side, you'll see a difference in the thickness of the deck because of that. There used to be other stocks, and there sometimes is other stocks. Depends on the company that's producing the cards, like for your other reasons, they can find stocks from different places, France or Germany, and use that with USB C finishes, and you get different thicknesses and stuff like that. But there used to be like aristocrat stocks, and, and there used to be a B casino stock as well, but now it's just bicycle and B. Um, the main manufacturers for playing cards, the good ones, USBC, United States Playing Card Company, a Legends Playing Card Company, an expert playing card company, which are from the same factory in Taiwan and China. Whereas MPC make playing cards, is also Noir Arts, NPCC, which is relatively new, and they're, you know, decent. But definitely, uh, Legends, expert in USBC, the top one. And I like all three, but especially USB-C and Legends. <clears throat> um, I should also talk about plastic playing cards. Not only can you get them in paper, these are bridge sized by the way, you can get them in plastic. Now plastic, these are vintage so they're a little bit yellow, a little bit darker, but um, what you can do with now, plastic playing cards, some people like them, some don't. They're a lot more flexible. They won't bend. They won't rip. And if they get dirty, they can be washed because they're plastic, they're PVC. So they're good in those respects. However, as far as flourishing and fanning and whatnot is concerned, they're not very good. So. Most people tend to use plastic cards for playing poker or other card games. For magic and flourishing purposes, paper is definitely preferred. And that was a 
that from chemical ink guards, which is not owned by USB-C. USB-C owns a lot of brands, many of which were from other companies in the past, like Hoyle, um, Aristocrat, Aladdin, Chem, as I was saying, B, Tally Ho. They all used to be owned by different companies until USB-C bought them out. But that's another lesson for another time. Um, another thing to talk about when it comes to playing cards is, well, why they're popular for magic and stuff like that. Well, for one, they're very familiar. People can easily relate to a deck of cards. Everyone has used them at some point in time. Most people own a deck of cards. So even if you don't have one on you, you could borrow one. And it's more powerful, I think, for magic when you use a borrowed deck because people will know the spectator will know that it's their deck of cards. There's no ga gimmicks or gaps, uh, gimmicks or gaps or setups, and they'll be like, what the heck, how do you do that? Um, I know it's not a special deck. Um, oddly enough, when it comes to gaps and gimmicks, a lot of people don't like to perform with decks like this because they're fancy. People will think they're special, gimmick, gaffed, when 9 out of 10 times you're not. Uh, ironically enough, the most trustworthy deck for Magic, Bicycle Rider Backs, or Standards, is the most gimmicked and gaffed deck in the world, bar none. <laughs> so it's pretty funny. The, the, the deck most people would trust to perform with, and that most spectators would trust, is the one that is more less, most likely to have a gimmick or a gaff available. Ah, uh, which is just kind of funny, I want. Um. But yeah, anyways, as I was talking about, I said that's any, these are the faces of the playing cards, and the Zack, Queen, and Kings are the court cards, of course, or face cards, and then these are the backs. Back designs come in a variety of styles and styles and colors and whatnot. I also forgot to mention the playing cards also come in a variety of styles and shapes. You can get circular decks from like India, oval decks, decks that are cut out like faces and stuff like that, you know, head shaped and whatnot. It's just, it's weird. There's all sorts out there, but I don't really recommend them. And there's also all the decks that you can find in magic shops that are crooked cut. No, don't have any of those either. Don't care for them. But anyways, back to the backs. This deck has a back design. It's very nice. Simple. It is symmetrical or mirror image. That is, if I reverse it, it's exactly the same. This is preferred for magic at anything because then you don't have to worry about them getting mixed up and reversed. And However, you can buy decks that have a one-way back, such as this one, where... If I take it and I reverse it, it is completely different. In this case, it is completely different. So it's definitely noticeable if you would have that in a deck of cards. And in addition, sometimes like one-way backs because they can use that to identify selection. Although most of just prefer to use sleight of hand. But if it is a subtle one-way back, like just a little minor detail or something, then it does work for magic even better because it's less noticeable. In this case, it would be highly noticeable. If you had a card reversed. The other back design I'll tell you about is a common one, which is a borderless back, like this one, like a B deck of cards. It's borderless. These ones have white borders. Again, some prefer one, some prefer the other. These ones are good for fanning and forcing because you can see everything. You can see the borders, you can see that the cards are spread out. While one like this, you don't notice so much. But that becomes helpful. With certain card moves and slights, it's easier to hide what you're doing, like second deals and whatnot, if you don't have a border. So some people prefer that. I, again, as a collector, I don't really care too much. But um, that's that. By the way, here's some of those gaps that I was mentioning that you can get in decks. Special double backers. But anyways, yeah. Borderless versus bordered, it's a big debate in playing cards. Some people like one, some like the other. And each has its own, you know, pros and cons. Another one, of course, to mention is if you take a deck like this, 
when you're doing magic, have a card selected, it gets reversed. There's no way they're going to tell. Uh, even if you just do like this, you can't tell. Pretty hard to tell. But if you do the same thing with a borderless deck like this, have a card reversed, only that it's a choker of all things, you can notice almost immediately that there's a card reversed. In this deck, it's actually not bad. But in other decks, you can actually see it on the side quite clearly. So it's not as practical for certain magic. But it is good for certain things as well. Especially for gambling demonstrations. Um, so we talked a little bit about people in plastic. We talked about finishes and stocks. Talked about the different companies. Also, again, yeah, you know, Legends and Expert Playing Card Company, they have different stocks and finishes. Um, but they're similar, either embossed or non embossed. Another finish is a plastic coated finish, which essentially is a deck of cards, usually made in China. There has been some from the SPC in the past, but not so much lately, where they put like a plastic coating over the cards. It helps protect them. But again, they're, they're not the best cards. Now, some might be wondering how to break in a deck of cards. When you get a brand new deck of cards, open it up. A lot of the time, it comes stiff. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these newer decks, they come nice out of the box. They're very flexible. But what I do, and a lot of people do to break in a deck of cards, is you simply shuffle them lots of times. Shuffle. You do the bridge. The reason why people do the bridge is because... When you do a riffle shuffle like this, you're bending the cards down. When you do the bridge, you reverse the bend. So it keeps the cards from getting bent. If you just you riffle shuffle all the time without doing the bridge, like I did, without doing... Uh, if you just do this, and you don't do this, you don't bend it back the other way, you're just going to bend the cards. So it's important to do the bridge. It's also good to do it this way, face up. In fact, I sometimes like to do this when I, if I were to perform, because then it clearly shows the spectator you're actually suffering the cards, and there's no suspicion. Just a little tip I like. And then the other things you can do to break them in, fan them out, spread them out, get those cards separated and everything, and it's all good. That's what I like to do. I fan them, spread them, shuffle them, cut them, etc., etc. I just, I play with them and play with them. That's how you break in a deck of cards, is by playing with them, handling them. Uh, a lot of people might be wondering how you keep a deck of cards clean. Most important thing is keep your hands clean. I work in construction, doing carpentry work, a lot of time I'm doing labor work, unfortunately. So my hands get dirty, they get dusty, they get dirty, sometimes I get talking with silicone on them or paint. Every time when I come home from work before I do unboxing videos and play with my cards, I wash my hands. Now it's important, it's a good tip to not use too much soap because a lot of soaps, when you wash your hands with them, they will dry out your hands. When your hands get dry, the body will produce more oil that will go onto the card. So you don't want to use too much soap and you want to try to prevent your hands from being too oily, greasy, sweaty. Because these are paper and moisture getting into them will ruin them. Another thing is use a clean surface. Don't play with your cards on a dirty kitchen table because they will get dirty. Now some people are concerned about spectators using the cards and damaging them or dirtying them. If you're concerned the spectator is not going to know how to properly shuffle a card and they're going to throw them all over the place and bend them then don't let them shuffle the cards. You can always try to ask questions beforehand to gauge how good they are with cards and judge whether or not you should allow them to shuffle or you can just shuffle them yourself. Let the spectator, you know, do a cut or something and then there's no problems. And you can always make sure that they're not eating or anything while you're performing with them so that their hands are clean. Another good tip 
keep beverages away because it's very easy to knock over a beverage and ruin your deck of cards. I haven't done that yet so far, so I'm all good. Not since I was a kid, we were camping one time, but that's another story. Um, what else can I tell you? As for keeping your cards in good condition, I like to keep my decks stored in boxes, or even outside boxes, stacked on top of one another. This helps compress them and keep them flat so that they're not getting warped. And again, it helps compress them to help them not be bent. Um, you can also store them like this if you want, as long as they're nice and tight and not, you know, loosey goosey. And I mean, it's fine, but if you leave them loose, then they might warp and bend, and you don't want that. So I prefer laying them down, but it's up to you. <clears throat> of course, with plastic cards, it doesn't really matter what you do with them, and you can always wash them. But with paper cards, you can't wash them. If they get dirty, they're dirty. You might be able to take a little bit of dirt off. But if they get dirty or sticky, you know, that's it. As far as moisture control, I've heard people talk about putting them in fridges or freezers if there's a lot of moisture or humidity. Best thing you can do is not overuse a deck of cards when you're using them. Because if you just keep using the same deck over and over and over, you're just going to wear it out. It's a good idea to use a deck of cards for a couple of hours and then switch it up with another one. That way, this deck has time to recuperate while you're using the other one and you don't just abuse the hell out of a deck. Storage is also important. You don't want to leave a deck laying around, you know, on a table like that. Put it in the box, tie it up with an elastic band, keep it together. Also, it's a good idea to store your decks out of the sunlight. If you leave them in the sun, the sun is going to dry them up and damage them. You don't want that. Keep them out of the sun. Put them in a box under your bed, in your closet, in a drawer. That's what I do. Have done. Do you do? <laughs> um, of course, if there's a lot of humidity in your area, you know, there's not much you can do over then. Kind of some of the stuff that I mentioned. Keep them out of the sun. Maybe put them in a fridge or a freezer. And now, you might be wondering where you can buy playing cards. Now, there's a, of course, I should mention there's... You can get just like a standard classic deck of cards. Like a bicycle rider back. And you can buy these at most stores, supermarkets, Walmarts, Targets, wherever. And I should mention also with the faces. You can get two styles of faces. A regular kind of standard index one and a jumbo index one which is often using gambling and it's nice and easy to read and, uh, and of course there's also other ones for vision impaired people but we won't get into that but these kind of standard decks you can buy at Costco's, Walmart's, most supermarkets especially in the states they're all over the place and there's all sorts of other bicycle decks that they sell at Walmart's and Targets as well as you've seen them from my reviews in the past custom decks like this you have to get online I always recommend collectiblepointingcards.com and if you use the code VJOSA free to get 10% off your order each and every time. But there's other ones like pointingcards.net, all your magic shops like Fear 11, Illusionist, Dan and Dave, and JP Pointing Cards if you're in the UK, Cards Magic in France, Card Volusion, and Magic Shop in Singapore and Asia. Those are some good ones. There's all sorts of shops all over the place. We can get cards online and for decent prices. Of course, these custom ones are more expensive, obviously. These ones are a lot cheaper. Oops. <laughs> I would recommend these. Buying these, you can buy them pretty cheap. At Costco, buy a brick, which is 12 decks, for a relatively good price. You can use them. You can perform with them. You can practice with them. I would never recommend practicing with a nice, custom, beautiful deck because... Then you'll just be kind of destroyed. Use cheap decks to practice with and abuse and get dirty and play with more than anything. Um, one thing I forgot to mention 
when it comes to cleanliness. Keeping them clean is if you drop a card on the floor, like I often do, whoops, don't pick it up like this because when you do this, you're dragging it around, you're pushing dirt into it. Take another card and scoop it up. That way you're not pushing it around, you're not getting dirt because if you get dirt into all these little dimples and pockets, then they're going to start to clump and get dirty and ruined. And that's kind of what the pockets are for, the dimples to capture dirt, to keep them off the faces so that they glide for longer. And the cleaner you keep them, the longer they last. That simple. Um, you can also buy, of course, decks on Amazon and eBay, all sorts of types of decks. Etsy.com and RubyLane.com are good for vintage decks. And in the U.S., Barnes & Noble, they sell a lot of decks, especially Fury 11. <clears throat> And Kickstarter, they find a lot of playing cards in there as well. Some people um, might wonder, what do you do with a deck of cards if it gets too dirty to use, it gets worn out? Well, aside from throwing it out, you could perhaps use it for an art piece. Um, you know, decorate your table or make something, make a card wallet, uh, a wallet out of playing cards. You know, there's all sorts of things you can do with used playing cards that are no good anymore. Um, and that is kind of that. If you have any comments or questions, let me know. I can't think of anything else. I think I've covered everything from borders to borderless, one-way backs. Of course, I could have always missed something. But anyways, that is that. I hope you liked the video. I know it's a bit long. Hopefully it was informative to somebody in some way. Comment, rate, subscribe. Let me know what you think. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.